Yeah, asked my team to send me a bunch of slides about uh, new results that uh, most of the uh, scientific community hasn't seen yet, and I got totally bombarded by stuff. So, uh, but many of the uh, results that I'm going to talk about here will also be uh, discussed in detail by various team members uh, who are at the conference as well. Next slide. So uh, the Diviner uh, lunar radiometer uh, is depicted right here. The instrument has three major science goals. One is to characterize the moon's thermal environment. And this is a very diverse thermal environment of almost all solar system bodies. Then also map the properties of the lunar surface, as well as characterizing the lunar polar cold traps. The instrument has nine spectral channels. We have a broadband solar channel and a set of infrared uh, channels that span the entire uh, range of thermal emission from the moon. Instrument has a field of view typically on the order of a couple hundred meters, a swath width of three kilometers, and it's been operating continuously, and I do mean continuously, like on all the time um, since July 2009. And in these three years, we've ac uh, accumulated an extremely extensive as well as scientifically rich data set. The next slide provides an idea of the type of data we get. These are actually our first global day and nighttime uh, temperature maps. And over the course of the mission now, we've accumulated uh, a large number of these maps. And the entire data set as of today, consists of more than 100 billion individual radiometric measurements of the surface of the moon. This is by far the most extensive uh, thermal data set uh, for any solar system body, I dare say, including the Earth, uh, for the reasons I'll describe in the next slide. What this is a map of is the <coughs> cumulative local time coverage that Diviner has, ac uh, has accumulated. What do I mean by this? Well, one of the really nice features of lunar orbit is that it's more or less, the plane is more or less fixed in inertial space. And so as the seasons progress on the moon over the course of an Earth year, we get data at every possible local time during this period. And then as the years go by, then the data sort of fills in. And so at any given point on the lunar surface, we have measurements at multiple local times. And what's plotted here is, for any point, how many hour, hours of distinct local coverage do we have? Now, there's been the hours, let's say, in 24. So one of these points here that's purple, of which there are very few, uh, has been observed at roughly four or five local times, randomly distributed through one, 0 through 24, whereas the points near 24 have complete saturation local time coverage. Means you could go into our database at one of these high latitude points and get data that basically covers the entire diurnal curve. This is very powerful in that, um, as we'll talk in just a bit, um, the more data you have, the more uh, information you can glean about the uh, properties of the surface as well as its composition. Next slide. I might say, just if I want to flip back one more time, that the, the, the reason why our do I have control of this? I guess I do. Oh, I have to point that way. Okay, that's why it's there. Uh, there we go. Uh, the the gradient in, in, in local coverage, in our coverage, is you know, because of the orbital convergence at the polar regions, and then the uh, somewhat sparsity of the data on the near side of the control regions is due to the spacecraft pointing off Nader to get some of the great data that you saw uh, in the previous talk. So this gives, gives you an idea of what's, what's happening there. And if you were to now go into our data set and sort of take a snapshot of what the data actually look like, let's say you were interested in Green Crater, not named after Jim here in the front row, but uh, it just happened to be one we picked. Uh, uh, the, uh, what, what's shown here are individual maps of Green Crater now at uh, 3.5 degrees north. So this is where our coverage is at its worst, right? Because, uh, and what it shows you is um, if you pick a two-hour time window, two hours of local time window, this shows you how much data we've acquired, uh, for instance, between 10 and, and noon, uh, noon and 2, uh, 2 and 3, or 2 and 4, et cetera, all around the clock. 
So it gives you an idea of the, of the density of coverage that we obtain as a function of local time. And you can see how the surface uh, uh, temperatures uh, are varying considerably over that time. During the nighttime, the diviner coverage is even better because we have no uh, competition from the other instruments to, to point the spacecraft in other directions. And that uh, shows our nighttime coverage, again, in, in two-hour bins. So this gives you an idea of, of uh, how dense the data is if you go into it, uh, which you'll be able to, uh, uh, to pull off of it. So in terms of the general theme for the uh, science of the instrument, um, I'll divide them into these three categories, compositional, thermophysical properties, and polar. And I'll show some new results uh, from all those three areas uh, for this meeting above what's been uh, uh, published. So this is um, the diviner uh, silicate mineralogy. This is determined by looking in three narrow band channels uh, near eight microns. Uh, laboratory measurements show that there's a position of a thermal emission feature uh, whose position is correlated uh, with silicate mineralogy. The uh, short wavelength peaks are feldspathic, light colored rocks. The long wavelength peaks are mafic, dark colored rocks. This is the global map, which has been previously published, which shows the obvious broad dichotomy between the uh, uh, Lunar Maria and the highlands. But interspersed in here are a lot of interesting anomalies, which were discovered by Diviner, uh, where a lot of the action is in terms of uh, uh, discovering new things about uh, the, uh, the uh, geological and, and chemical history of the planet. Uh, we published on the uh, presence of highly silica-rich areas, which are related to uh, 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 unusual volcanism on the moon, uh, as well as uh, plagioclase poor areas as well. In terms of uh, what the team is doing right now, one of the interesting uh, foci has been uh, looking at um, uh, glass deposits, uh, these pyroclastic deposits that were uh, discovered uh, on the moon. These are uh, amongst the most iron-rich deposits and therefore would be predicted uh, to show up in our maps of this uh, CF or Chris Johnson frequency position. Uh, Carl Allen at JSC has been taking the lead in this analysis, and this didn't turn out exactly right uh, due to PowerPoint problem, but uh, this is a swift <laughs> map of this feature uh, for Taurus Litro Valley. And I guess this is the most important one, uh, which shows the correlation um, of the CF feature, sort of, excuse me, uh, on the, uh, on the uh, 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 horizontal axis. Uh, and the FEO percentage on the vertical axis. And it shows the correlation between these two parameters for actual uh, analytic measurements of these quantities uh, at the Apollo sites on this axis, and then uh, measurements of the uh, uh, CF position from uh, uh, laboratory measurements. And you can see the strong correlation. And then what's interesting, of course, is the Taurus Litro pyroclastic show up way up at then. This prevent, uh, potentially gives us a way of studying pyroclastic deposits that are not associated with the Apollo landing sites. And some work has been done there uh, to look at some regions here. Here's one at uh, Rima Fresnel uh, that shows our measured composition of that. So um, this is very interesting work to sort of now extend our results beyond uh, what's observed at the landing site. In addition to this, the team has been doing a new series of measurements of the detailed spectroscopy of this CF position on lunar samples. And this shows the uh, sample numbers and uh, our, uh, our, our, our measurements. These lines represent the three spectral channels that Diviner measures these quantities at. One thing that has been coming out of this is that um, as we refine our analysis more, we find it's very important to correlate the exact location on the surface where the deposits were, where the samples were acquired with the exact measurements uh, co-located from Diviner orbit. Because even within a landing site, within the range of the uh, rovers or the uh, astronauts walking around, there are noticeable variations of these quantities. And so we need to uh, do this more detailed. And when this has been done, and just gives an example of the diversity of the uh, Diviner measurements in this area, 
And each of these little spots here, of course, has samples that we can do the correlation with. And this is uh, some new results that show exactly how good this correlation is. And in this one, we plot uh, CF position along this axis. On this one, uh, we have uh, aluminum oxide weight content. You see the very nice correlation there. And this one, we see uh, the same parameters with iron oxide content. So this shows that we're able to uh, get some very detailed and uh, believable information about some of these important major chemical properties uh, of the lunar uh, samples uh, from orbit with the Viner. And of course, what's beautiful about the moon is it's the only body where we have this wonderful ground truth where we can actually compare uh, measurements from orbit uh, with uh, detailed uh, analytical measurements from lunar samples. So we're really uh, exploiting the entire uh, power of all of our data sets to make these measures and determinations. Another interesting area uh, of study are these lunar swirls. Uh, these are areas that show these um, interesting patterns that are uh, believed to be related to uh, 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 magnetic anomalies uh, on the lunar surface. The divider measurements of these swirls show two things. One is that uh, there's a small uh, variation in the uh, CF position associated with the bright lunar swirls area. That's shown in this area for the Reiner Gamma lunar swirl. And interestingly, when we look at the temperature anomalies associated with these lunar swirls, these turn out to be uh, almost invisible. And here's an example of the swirl. And well, here's the temperature anomaly associated with the swirl. You can barely see it. So what this means is that the uh, swirls, in terms of their thermal physical properties, are uh, not unusual. Uh, but the fact there is a small change in CF um, is interpreted from lab measurements and other things that we're seeing on the surface as a small difference in the uh, space weathering component uh, having to do with uh, uh, the uh, uh, cosmic rays from the sun. The other hypothesis for the swirls, uh, other, and, and this, uh, this is interesting because basically there's like little magnetospheres uh, associated with these lunar swirls area which are deflecting charged particles. These then uh, do not darken the surface to the same extent as outside the swirl. And this provides a nice uh, tidy explanation. The larger implication of this is that um, uh, there are two competing hypotheses for what causes the overall darkening of the lunar surface. One due to these uh, particles from the sun, the other uh, due to uh, the effects of uh, meteorite, micrometeorite bombardment and the creation of dark materials uh, such as iron, uh, microscopic or nanophase iron in the crust. It looks like at least in these areas uh, that the uh, space weathering hypothesis uh, is the uh, more dominant one, at least uh, here. And so that's a very interesting way of sort of using these swirls as interesting tests for the weathering hypothesis. In terms of diviner's thermal pro physical properties measurements, one of the main goals has been to try to uh, come up with a formula, a model, shall we say, of a lunar surface that works in most areas. And one approach that has been used is to basically take all of the data that diviner has acquired right at the equator and make a beautifully detailed uh, plot of the diurnal temperature variation, which is shown here. So this is like our you know, base standard model. And, uh, Two things are shown here. There's uh, lunar highlands measurements as well as lunar mare measurements, which are sort of uh, superimposed. And it turns out, uh, from this perspective, uh, they're remarkably similar. Um, and this means that the processes that determine uh, the thermophysical properties in the uppermost sort of few centimeters of the surface, which we're sensitive to, um, are basically the same in both places, uh, or in both terrains on the moon. And we've derived um, a new uh, lunar uh, thermal uh, properties model that shows density as a function of depth as well as thermal conductivity in the depth as a function of depth. Uh, here's the three examples, uh, which uh, provide a good formula for matching it. This is very important because uh, this then serves the basis for looking for variations in these properties all around the planet. 
Another thing we're doing with Diviner is uh, looking at eclipse measurements. Here's a catalog of eclipses that have occurred uh, during the LRO mission. One we didn't even realize was on 7-7-2009, right after we got in orbit, there was actually a penumbral eclipse. I don't know if anybody in the project remembers this, but anyway, uh, it's in there. And the eclipses are important because um, we can use those to probe uh, the very near surface thermal properties uh, of the regolith uh, uh, down to maybe about a half a centimeter. The analysis of these are ongoing. It's interesting that partial eclipses are just as good for us in the places they exist on the moon as total eclipses are because from the standpoint of a place on the moon that's got, gotten a partial eclipse, it does go through a very significant variation in insulation. Um, here's some models that show how the eclipse works, an infrared eclipse, and this shows the approximate uh, temperature effect of these eclipses in the depth to which it penetrates, maybe the top five millimeters of the, of the uh, surface. The initial results are is that there's a very super fluffy layer in this very uh, top five millimeters of the uh, undisturbed uh, lunar regolith, and we're still working on uh, deriving its detailed properties. Another big component of our uh, thermophysical measurements are measurements of rock abundance and soil temperature. The rock abundance, of course, provides an aerial measure of the rock. The soil temperature is sort of like thermal inertia. It's how cold the surface gets at night. Um, the maps that have been published so far by Banfield et al. are 32 pixels per degree, about one kilometer resolution. We're now producing a much more better resolved version of this. Uh, we've done a lot of detailed mapping of the footprints of the Viner. And these maps are now being improved to give a resolution of 128 pixels per degree. So you can see between these slides uh, the differences there. This is an interesting feature, uh, one that we've discovered uh, through Diviner, called the cold spots. These are associated with small young craters uh, that show uh, very beautiful uh, sort of uh, flower-like patterns uh, in the LROC data. This is a picture of one here. This is one kilometer for scale. What's so interesting about these cold spots is that the warm thermal anomalies that we see are associated with the blocks that are uh, exhumed during the impact. And then surrounding those is a much larger cold thermal anomaly that extends uh, typically 10 or 20 times the diameter of the visible splotch on the surface. Uh, we're still trying to figure out what these are. Uh, they're probably uh, related to some sort of granular flow phenomenon. Uh, that's associated with these impacts, and volatiles could be an important part of uh, the driving force behind these. We're also looking at terrain roughness. Uh, it's like I'm running out of time, so I won't be able to talk about all this, but at any rate, uh, we can also measure aspects of the roughness of the terrain, uh, and we're doing this through looking at the data and comparing that with other measures of roughness, such as LOLA, uh, and also with models, and we'll see uh, talks about this later on to try to figure out what uh, Divine is really measuring when it makes all these different measurements in these different channels. And if I can just maybe 30 seconds about the polar deposits, um, a lot of exciting polar data. This is a, a beautiful picture that we took uh, from of continuous imaging uh, in the south polar region of Mars. Many areas here never been seen before. Um, and in the infrared, of course, uh, we're able to observe them. The most notable feature of our polar observations is the extreme cold temperatures that are observed uh, in some places lower than 25 Kelvin, which is lower than we predicted and lower than the uh, um, uh, science definition team that uh, defined the requirements for, <laughs> for Diviner when we first uh, uh, were selected here. But it's a good thing we had a lot of extra performance and, and we were able to measure these super cold temperatures uh, quite effectively. We've talked about measurements in the north before. We've identified uh, some more super cold regions in the south. Uh, this is Hayworth Crater. Uh, there's a super cold region there, and this gives you an idea of the uh, complexity of the both the, the diurnal and seasonal temperature variations we observe in these cold regions. This is due to small variations in scattered sunlight and infrared radiation that occur. This is three years now uh, worth of data at this particular spot, and you can see the types of measurements we have. Uh, some of these super cold regions, we can immediately start to put some upper limits on the uh, heat flow from the interior of the moon, and our initial measurements suggest that um, these heat flow rates are quite a bit smaller. Here's the temperature and here's the approximate heat flow rates than was measured at the two Apollo landing sites. We're still working to put error bars on this and to recalibrate all our data to get better precision. 
Um, but um, here's a global map that shows uh, thorium abundances, the two Apollo sites were close to this major thorium abundance. This is the heat source. The two sites that we have in the north and south polar region are far away from these and probably provide a better indication of global heat flow. And the last thing I want to say is we're producing a lot of new types of data sets to make our data set more accessible and uh, accurate uh, for uh, those in the community. Here's our current data sets and here are the new data sets we're producing, recalibrated maps and stuff like that. And we encourage uh, everyone uh, to use this data set and we'll be happy to help you in your efforts to do that. So just get in touch with us if you're interested. Thank you.